Hello, hello, hello. Good evening out there in Facebook land. It is I, Summer Sibley Brown. I'm one of your faithful co-hosts of Politox. And um, I want to say happy VA History Month. Um, I want to say happy Women's Month. Last week, we started off with a bang. We did, um, we had some really cool clips of Sarah and Addy, and we got to kind of talk with the cast and crew and the director, and that was a really auspicious start to um, VA History Month. Um, and kind of looking back at something that I still think was really progressive, right? The way in which the satire of Sarah and Addie was used to address some of the really important, relevant, and stickier topics, right? Intractable things that were happening in our community, but I actually made it really invitational. Um, and I think, not I think, I know tonight we're going to like continue with the trend of, um, for me, all things VI. If you watch Politox, you know that we have um, a small bent for the radical, right? Or at least exploring the radical mentally, like what it looks like in theory, what we think should happen. And there's some trigger words that we use a lot, like they're always in our conversations. Um, and one of those words is decolonization. Yes, that's right, decolonization. And according to the Oxford Dictionary that I Googled, um, it is the action process or state of withdrawing from a former colony, right? It's, um, there's, you know, there's thoughts of sovereignty in there. There's thoughts of dealing with internalized oppression. Um, there's, there's this process of actually knowing our history and fulfilling out, out uh, a fuller narrative and then having control over the narrative going forward um, that centers on us as Virgin Islanders. And um, I'm not an expert in this. This is, this is my understanding. And tonight's conversation is really to be in conversation with people who do have this conversation and have more information um, and actually more expertise on the subject of decolonization. So we could figure out like, what does it actually mean for us, right? What does it actually mean? And hello, Kemet. Summer, how you doing? Fine. You see the benefit of being our only child? You see how long I could talk to myself without mm -hmm. having a friend? It's our only child. <laughs> Me and the mirror, I, like, I just, I just had this conversation with Tuesday. Like, I didn't have imaginary friends, but I can't talk to myself. That's good. Um, as long as, well, I guess you can talk back to yourself if you'd like to, you know. Mm, I don't good. answer. You think people yeah. think we're crazy? It's always good to have two-way conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, good so to join you tonight. Um, How are you? Again, like you said, uh, pretty much every single week we have mentioned the word um, decolonization or hinted to it and, um, and how much all of us on the call on, on the podcast have for many years been, you know, thinking about it and, you know, wishing that there would be more on the bandwagon, but I'm excited about um, the guests that we have tonight to share in this conversation with us. So, yeah. Yes. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I want to tell all the Frank fans that he will be back. Nobody replaced Frank. I mean, the beard game is tight on Kemet, though we have to say it is better. that if we was to put it to a vote, we don't know what would Being happen. Objective. But Mr. Robinson um, may be joining us later, or and he will, will most likely be back next week. Yeah. So don't be like, puff Frank there. He yeah. just decided to ditch us. We will deal with that after. <laughs> yeah, and it's a trade-off. You know, I can't cook or mix the way that he he does and you know mm -hmm. i just have a better beard you know it's i mean yeah beard drinks i just like being stuck tomato in the, tomato. the bowl. tomatoes yeah. tomatoes you know beard game good drinks hmm. yeah. i look like have a nice beard game too the two out of you black okay. magic no so the beard game smells really good as your friend mm -hmm. i have to say the bow tie beard smell really good yeah. and back to decolonization <laughs> because tonight's topic is actually about that um <laughs> Um, 
you know, so we talk about it every week and it comes up. We also talk a lot about systems and within the system, we talk about like decolonizing it. And I have realized, Kemet, that when you begin to have that conversation, it becomes very polarizing, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who just really don't want to hear it. Um, and I don't, my assumption is, is that maybe we don't know enough information Mm-hmm. about decolonization, what it actually means, um, pathways to it, what are potential end results, um, how you come up on that type of, like, because it is, there is a piece there about self-determination, like how you actually come up on that and the community's role or the the whole's role in deciding it. It's not like one person say, we're going to decolonize tomorrow and we stamp a seal and that right. happens. And where we end up is based on one. And so I'm really excited today to have um, Dr. Hadia Sewer Mm -hmm. and Mr. Kurt Marsh joining us. And I want to say, like, shout out to the St. Jonians in the house. (laughs) Um, Welcome, welcome. (laughs) Like, we always be like, how do we get people from St. John to join the show? And tonight we have two and um, two if you would allow to compliment two powerhouses at that, Mm -hmm. um, who I admire um, really so welcome. And Kevin, you want, you know, we can start off with questioning. I can start off with questioning. Like, let me, what do you want to do? No, it's, uh, it's, I'll defer to you. Um, Yes, we're in, you know, 2021, women's first um, might not be, you know, you might not want to hear that, but um, I'll defer to you as the wiser. Um, so, I, I didn't say older, but as the wi- wiser of the two of us, I'll defer to you to kick it off. <laughs> so I probably am older, so I'll take yeah, that. Sure, um, yeah. I got more gray hair for sure. Um, and I guess for our guests, I want to say welcome, and we could start off with, you know, I would like to hear just a little bit about your St. Julian backgrounds and even your, so you could tell us all about your family, your lineage, whatever you feel like sharing. Um, And then like your intro or your, no, yeah, I'll do the decolonization next round. Then we just start with the people, the human. Um, And anybody could come off mic and go. Yeah, well, good evening. And it's actually really wonderful to be here and to share space with you. So thank you, of course. Uh, for inviting us. And I into, I love how, you know, as Virgin Islanders, we like orient almost every conversation with the question of like genealogy, like who are you and like, who do you belong to? I think that these are really like central questions for us. And I feel like it really helps to develop like a sense of like love and pride and um, that are really central, I think, for fostering conversations around decolonization. So I also want to thank you for starting with that tradition, so to speak. Um, I am, of course, uh, a Bon and Red St. Jonian, and my ancestry on St. John in particular, if you look at like the recorded history, can go back to like the 1600s. Um, but my family is also uh, Black and Indigenous, and so the oral history suggests that we were in the Virgin Islands and the White Caribbean for a lot longer than that. Uh, I carry, of course, the last name Sewer, and so I am definitively from those East End St. Jonians in particular, uh, especially those who have like a really long history in the marine industry. A lot of people know me as like the Love City Fairies kid, but of course my dad wasn't necessarily the first captain in my family lineage, so to speak. You know, my great grandfather, if not like my great 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 grandfather and them were also um, captains in the St. John area. And so we have, of course, uh, that history of quote-unquote land owning as well as what it might mean for some branches of the family to be free prior to emancipation as many Virgin Islanders on the east end of St. John I also have really close ties to the BVI and so the Saw family actually originally migrated to St. John from like Yos Van Dyke for people who don't necessarily know that but my mother people are all from Tatola and so I, and then my dad's mother's family 
uh, is Ethiopian. And I think that my dad actually grew up in Ethiopia for a bit before moving back to St. John to be with his dad's family. And I found that some of my father's like nostalgia for Ethiopia in particular as like one of the pinnacles and like illustrations of like black sovereignty for many of us uh, essentially led me at a really early age to, okay, to question what exactly it means. Okay, give me a second to be, um, non-sovereign in the caribbean so i'll pop over to kurt since and you know if we, since we're talking about family like my children have now intervened uh but yeah that's the short part of like how i come to the question of sovereignty to family uh so also born in bred saint union um i'm actually hadi and i are actually double maybe triple however you want however it breaks down we're cousins in multiple ways i'm actually uh, also a sewer from eastern st john um and so uh i carry a lot of that same you know long-standing history on st john um, um one part of my family being of free the free peoples of eastern um, uh and we were able to trace ourselves, you know, back to that space um, to early 1700s or so. Uh, but I do have very deep um, overall uh, British Virgin Islands roots as well. Uh, I don't take after the seaman um, part of our heritage. I take after the craftsman part of our heritage. And so um, in, in a lot of my earlier years, understanding, you know, lineage and family uh, history and legacy, especially legacy, uh, has been around learning uh, none of my uncle, my great uncle, Abelino Samuel, and becoming a, wood, a professional woodworker. And so um, uh, similarly to Hadia, these, these conversations about, you know, it's always it's it's so it's a beautiful thing when we say you know who you're fat. Uh, I I think I had a post on Facebook recently where I was just like celebrating the insular tribe because you walk around Cruise Bay currently all of Saint John and it's like hey, what's there how you doing uh, family um, and so uh, it, it's it really is a beautiful thing. Um, this this context around you know who we are and, and especially like how it relates to like our long standing ideas and concepts about legacy and identity because i think since we're talking about colonialism um like the raping and pillaging of this place has left us like very very devoid of like a deep ancestral um I guess, celebration of identity. And so I think we were at a place now as a fallout of this colonial ex experiment, um, we're at a place now where we're kind of just like, we're acting, right? It's not a lot of rooted in this ancestral legacy anymore. It's for sure the Mokojumi is on the dock because tourists coming in off the cruise ship. And so we bastardized some of our like icons. It's the Mokojumi and a guardian no more, it's somebody it's a thing that we put on display so people could think, oh, wow, there's, this is something nice about this place. Um, but anyway, we'll get to that. Sorry, reeling it back. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting carried away. No, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, yes, yes, come through, jump in. Like, um, because I could identify um, with so much of what you're saying um and like their words that i already use that just like speak to my spirit personally right and um the black sovereignty legacy land owning um identity the truth of how we are bastardizing parts of our culture which um really is an extension capitalism is an ex in my view is an extension of colonialism and we are so far down um, in drinking at their water and hole that we don't even realize the ways in which we perpetuate our own oppression still um, and not really are in control of the narrative. So like we could jump in, we don't even have to, you know, 
There is no night, you know, that was, I was just like, yes. I was so happy. Okay, I done. Like, I don't get hype. <laughs> Can I, before, you know, because I could talk forever. Um, yeah, I, I, I like starting there. Um, and um, maybe if, um, if you both can share your thoughts on, on just that and, and, you know, maybe some of the other examples um, where we are, where the culture is, is kind of taken in a completely different route and tried to be packaged and sold. And I see how there are a few instances where it's, um, where it can be different, um, especially on St. Croix around the holidays um, when visitors are on the island and they, um, they come to us, Stanley Trump with, with us, it's, it's a, if it's a different scenario, right? Because it's not, we're not taking Stanley to the, to the pier to welcome the tourists, um, but they're allowed um, or encouraged to participate in it with us. And it's a completely different thing, but um, yeah, if you can, if we can start there, I think that'd be great. Uh, just um, for, for people that might, might be doing it or part of it and don't recognize what it actually is. Um, I think that'll be great. Um, one of the, the conversations we've had in a number of scenarios are around the um, the old windmills. Uh, I think your perspectives on that um, would be interesting to hear also. Um, and I don't, I struggle with it also, but um, and I know that our our history as African descendants in the Caribbean began when we came. But um, any thoughts on you know what existed before us, and you know thoughts as to why it's not as celebrated? And I guess it, it would be hard for us to celebrate it since it's not quote unquote our like my history. It is the Virgin Islands history. Um, so yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, if you remember any of those points, um, feel free to jump jump in. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. I, um, one of my favorite things about the virtual space is the dance of figuring out um, the cues of who's going to speak when without actually being able to see that in person. But I think that, you know, when I think of the level of collective soul loss that I feel like we experience as a result of colonialism on St. John, I think of gentrification and land rights dispossession in particular as being an extension of the colonial um, order into the contemporary moment. And I say this to say that if I were to make like a laundry list <laughs> of issues on St. John as this particular context, um, speaking to it in particular. Uh, on one hand, we would have like the gentrification. On another hand, we would have the question around whether or not our education system is adequately teaching us uh, the history of ourselves as Afro-Caribbean um, people, and not just the history of ourselves as Virgin Islanders, right, but the Virgin Islands as a part of the wider Caribbean, as well as a part of the wider uh, African diaspora. I think that we would also have to grapple with some of the ways in which many of our sacred symbols, uh, such as the Mukojumbi, but also even the Zemis of the indigenous people of the Caribbean are appropriated to sell items to the consumers who come to our shores. And then we also then have to have a different conversation altogether about even our economy uh, a bit more writ large and whether or not it's just and what it might mean for a lot of our products, whether it be our products in the tourism industry or even just our products a bit more widely are skewed towards the taste of the consumption of people who are coming from the contiguous United States of America and or Europe and what it actually means for us to try to survive in this particular context where um, white normativity 
is an invisible power structure, right? Because I think that what separates us from the continental United States of America is that if you were to talk about white supremacy and anti-blackness in the United States, that seems a bit more legible to people when they understand it to be a white majority uh, governing structure. And in the Virgin Islands, that becomes a bit more obscure when, of course, our government for the most part looks like us. And so I think that a part of the harder conversation that we find ourselves having is that whether we're in a black majority or a white majority space, we still have to see things like our EDC benefits program or the establishment of the Virgin Islands National Park and its displacement of Black and Indigenous um, Virgin Islanders through catalyzing this like luxury tourism model, uh, as well as just some of the structural violence, right, around our inaccessible healthcare, our poor infrastructure, and just the very high murder rate that we see in our territory as being a part of larger structures of like anti-blackness uh, and structural violence a bit more broadly. And so I think that if I were to kind of like paint these um, issues with like a really broad stroke, so to say, uh, I would, you know, argue that what we feel in terms of like cultural heritage loss and, you know, land dispossession is also very much tied to a lot of these um, structural issues on global forces around anti-Blackness. And I think that because we are a Black majority space in the Caribbean, that sometimes it becomes a little bit more challenging uh, to trace and continuously keep track of the power lines and to see our, what we would call our like local corruption, so to speak, as being really the result of like large colonial imperial forces. Kurt, I'm gonna let you talk, but I just wanted to say if there was a word, Politox word bingo, I was typing, so there is a mix. We have a private chat, people, just so y'all know. You know, we to keep it real. So, but I was typing the words that you were saying, right? And so there is a mix of bingo, 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 and new thought, new thought, new thought, right? Or new words to put to that. And I just wanted to say that I found girlman right now. I'm just like, oh my God, the St. Jonians, Kurt didn't even speak, but the things that he typed, I'm just like, the St. Jonians need to be on the show. Like, like I <laughs> It's, it's done. We have to find a way for this energy to remain. And I'm going to be quiet, Kurt. I'm sorry. I'm just like in heaven right now. Look, you are right, you know, because I don't find girl over Dr. Sewa also. I don't find boy over Dr. Sewa. Uh, you know, the, every, especially when she talks about the violence of colonialism, because it is violent, like spiritually, intellectual, intellectually, intellectually. Uh, uh, it, man, emotionally, all the all the ways in which like this exercise just beats a people down, like and, and it beats you into submission, really. And and then, as she mentioned before, our government looks like us, but we've like claimed this like neoliberal, um, or we've claimed like our ties to this neoliberal exercise for so long that we believe that we're doing something good for our people. Um, uh, I want to back up a little bit and uh, talk a, 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 for a taste about like how um, we experience like this, like Hadia mentioned soul loss. And in that soul loss, we obviously like are really struggling with identity. I mean, as a people who, you know, there, there was a moment, right, where Denmark, all the, 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 the folks who were here colonizing this space had left after emancipation, industry was, um, the, the plantation industry was shuttering, people were selling estates, um, you know, local families uh, in one way or the other were purchasing properties at auction, things like that. There was a moment where there was this lull where Virgin Islanders had an opportunity. And I'm speaking about St. John in, but about St. John in particular right now because it's the context I'm most familiar with. But there was a lull where we had an opportunity to form a new community in, in, in a free space. We were able to have it. We were able to craft. We were, you know, our old folks talk about club where everybody come to the yard. You're building a house. Everybody, all hands on deck. The wives are cooking. The children playing, and then it goes to the next house, and then the next house, and the next house. There was all this amazingly beautiful like camaraderie around the village 
supporting itself because we understood that to be our way of sustaining, right? We understood that to be how we'd survive, never individually, but always collectively because we understood ourselves to be a collective, right? And so like, that's a part of the violence of colonialism, right? Everybody's so hell-bent on, uh, right now at least, we're so like stuck in these ways of trying to survive on our own. And so we've like lost the collective, so to speak, you know? And, and a part of that violence too is that, you know, we, when we started to develop like this, this, this positionality, right, where we were attaining some sort of recompense, we were able to, we were free, we were able to buy land and build and open businesses and things like that. We, we, were lo we started to lose that recompense by forced visitation, as I want to call it, because we essentially were sold from one master to the next. And so we don't have the opportunity to determine who, who we're going to be and how in this new world, right? We, we have this absence of Denmark when everyone left sort of after emancipation, but then this like very heavy handed, like sudden presence of the United States. And so we're in this position now where we're trying to figure out ourselves. We've developed these like new ways of thinking and being and all of that, but then we have this reality of this context of forced visitation, right? By the American tourists, right? And so what does that do? That becomes something that really starts to drive, especially in the neoliberalist, uh, uh, capitalist American regime, it drives economy. And what happens with the economy? The economy is controlled by the, the, the superstructure and the superstructure is the American empire, right? And so what we're doing now is we're shifting gears and we're becoming this entity that is subservient. Uh, because according to the United States Constitution, we are second-class citizens, we are an alien race, and we're here at the service and le uh, leisure of our new visitors, right? And so what happens to our culture? Our space, because of the heavy hand of the United States government, we can't fish in the same places, we can dance and play music in the same places, we have boundaries now, you could have moved from one yard to the next, but now land is sold and walls are going up, and so there are these very rigid real boundaries of space and so that this possess we, we are experiencing this possession right because now we can't eat the same because we can't fish in the same places and these reefs are now protected by the national park and we can't shoot there unless a permit and you can't get a permit unless you do this process and who knows about this process because where are these people right where is the federal government and saint john where is the national park and so we start to experience this like really ridiculous form of like this perpetual settler colonial uh, reality, right? And and now we have to engage, we have to engage with these people, and so it becomes a context where we are trying to figure out, well, okay, well, I want to make me conscious on them and things still, but where where do I live now? So then now the question moves to like positionality, right? Where do I occupy space in this new project? how can i occupy space in this new project where is the space for me and i'm saying john that's particularly discomforting because i reference you know downtown cruise we a lot all of 80 90 percent of the properties in downtown cruise are still owned by ancestral saint juniors but 95 percent of the businesses aren't and when people visit us the, 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 that's not uh, what they're present, what's that? What they're confronted with? What they're confronted with is the business, the sign on the door, the things in the window. That's the narrative, and so we've experienced for such a long time this sort of hijacking of the narrative of like our Virgin Islands identity and our our space and our legacy, and so we're we're we're, we're continually like facing this very extractionist regime, and it's almost like we don't have we haven't had a chance in a hundred years under American rule, we haven't had a chance to not be reactive to all of these very heavy handed, aggressive, brutal forces that come from beyond our shores. And then to Dasuwa's point, we have politicians who like are feeding this apparatus. They're, 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
we have an EDC system that you know brings everyone here instead of an EDC system that bolsters the folks who are, uh, are, are have you know generational businesses and things like that. We have barge company and thing at St. John paying 30, 40,000 hours taxes a month. And we have rich corporate entities coming from America and pay none. So, the, you know, like this topic, um, one, exploring it ex excites me. And then the other side of the excitement is like, there's this like aching in my heart, right? Because I don't find so, there is so, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's like this inner revisiting of enslavement, right? Um, and and not and not knowing and something being taken from you all the time, all the time, not knowing where you fit. I had a struggle with that, right? Like that's the thing I want. If, where is the space for me and minds? And I also have people. I don't feel like I'm against anybody. What I am is for for my children, for my family, right? Like, come, I'll, but like, where's the respect? Where is the, like, there's there's no centering on us as Virgin Islanders. We are taught that we need to, you are so right, center it on, on them and they, and who can come because one, we don't see ourselves as part of the solution to any of what we are experiencing now in our community. It's an external answer. Um, and though I think what has created the situation is external forces, we want to use the same thing that created the situation to answer it with no internal, with no, with no, with no looking into the power that has maintained us, which is our people and and our ancestral legacy. And um, I agree with you. I work in systems change, and a lot of what um, the company that hired me, the outside, one of the things that they say they love about me is my perspective. We're having a conversation about equity today. And I told them, you know, I was like, so you don't hear the, the statement, change happens at the speed of trust, right? Well, if that's the case, equity happens at the depth of relationship. You have to begin to give people back their whole humanity, right? And we have to be able to see each other. But even within, there are power dynamics um, between right? And those are the black-white lines. Those are the ones that people, those are the clear racial lines that Americans experience that they're accustomed to. But they're also power dynamics among. And those things to me come from the internalized oppression. It comes from assimilationist mindsets, right? Where I feel like the only way that I can be good and, and successful in my community is by adapting what um the colonizer has given to me. So if I learn to wield their system well, that means I'm going to do well. And we have a lot of leaders who have been educated with the assimilationist mindset. And even the most radical among us are operating, right, in the constructed frame. They actually don't want to do something new and they don't want to go back to something ancestral. They want to manipulate the construct that has been given to them and position it as radical and they still swallowing the seed of I, not we. So like it's it and and it's blown because when you have these conversations or attempt to have these conversations within and among these groups, they think we're crazy. Like what you know, like they feel like we's Christopher Columbus, we just stumble onto a term, decolonization, and we just over here being radical, 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 talk, 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 but we don't actually understand what it would take to power the Virgin Islands, but they don't genuinely want to engage, right? And so how do you find, you know, like the two of you, I just in a short time, like have such powerful voice and deep understanding, like as you're trying to spread this message and be in conversation, how do you find you're received? I'm actually going to circle around a little bit in order uh, to answer that question. I hope that that's okay. But one of the things I wanted to jump in really quickly and say is that there's a quote by Ruha Benjamin, who's like a professor in African-American studies at Princeton. And I want to quote her, right, because I think it's actually really important to what we're all talking about right now. She gave a talk the other night on race and tech, and she said that imagination is a contested site of action and that some people are forced to live in other people's imaginations. And we have to wrestle with the desires that many people have for social domination. And I thought it's so central to a lot of our conversations that we have 
about living in the Virgin Islands, desiring decolonization, and then how the discourses on decolonization are framed by people who, you know, quite frankly, are really pro status quo in one capacity or another, right? And if we're really honest with ourselves, we're like living out the legacy of the plantation system, right? And so because we're grappling with the aftermaths of like slavery, because we're grappling with the perpetuation of colonialism in the contemporary moment, I think that it is natural to some extent that people desire some illusion of safety and security, right? And so that is, for me, the long-winded way of saying that, no, I don't think that a lot of um, my pro-decolonization discussions are received particularly well um, in spaces outside of some of the smaller bubbles that we may have curated to push these conversations forward. But I think a part of the reason that that's the case is because we're being forced to live out some of the American colonial, imperial, settler colonial desires to consume the Virgin Islands as a paradise that belongs to the United States of America, right? And so what actually happens, right, to people of African descent across the globe as a response to our histories of resistance. And one of the things I talk about a lot in like my academic work is really the question of hesitation. And, you know, we kind of call it a fancy term, like aporia, <laughs> according uh, to like uh, Derrida in particular. But at the crux of hesitation is really having to come to grips with some of the ways in which empire shapes our desires. And I think that that becomes really important because as Virgin Islanders, if we're really like honest with ourselves, what we might all agree on is that we want a good life. <laughs> we want a good life. And I think what we disagree on is how exactly to bring that good life into fruition. And if we're living out the aftermath of the plantation system, the sad truth of the matter is our hundred of years, hundreds of years of experience have taught us that people who resist white supremacy, slavery, you know, anti-black violence, gross policing are brutally harmed. And I feel like once you have histories of resistance and you start to see how state sanctioned violence responds to even some of the mildest critiques of power, you start to get a majority of people who recognize very clearly that the path to freedom is stalked by death, right? And this is like a, a paraphrase of something that I believe Angela Davis said once. And for the sad truth is that if we want the good life and the good life is being sold to us as very much tied to neoliberalism and free market logic and individualism, and then somewhere in our subconscious, we recognize that people who have really pushed for the freedom of like black and indigenous um, people have met untimely debts, have been in prison and or um, they have been branded as quote unquote radical or communist or whatever derogatory term people like to construct and deploy and weaponize, even when some of these terms aren't actually problematic in and of themselves when you think of uh, the history or the context, then we start to recognize that like our complicitness in many ways is structured. Um, and it is the result of a long history of violence and a long history of coercion. And so to me, I see the response <laughs> with the discomfort that we have around decolonization, especially in the Virgin Islands. And I honestly think quiet as it's kept, a lot of our hesitation as a community is actually rooted in Fountain Valley in particular and how people understand the very quiet rumblings of a pro-independence Virgin Islands and what we may or may not understand about the outcome of that particular uh, trajectory. And then we can look across the Caribbean and see uh, the sanctions that Cuba had to endure. And then we can also look at America's like imposition and invasion across the region. And we see the history of Haiti, we see the history of Grenada, and we recognize that occupation. And I think it sees a fear that we are not always willing and able to grapple with overtly. 
Wow, thank you. <laughs> Again, I'm having one of Summer's moments um, right now listening to you. Um, I, I don't know if it's early in the conversation, but you know, what a, most of what I've been thinking about as you guys speak right now um, this evening has been how do we um, approach the masses, um, not just the, you know, the people that, you know, you were talking about, everybody wants to live um, a, a good life or um, wants to live well. Um, and I'm just thinking about how that means so many different things to so many different people in one community. Um, and it goes back to a number of the conversations that we've had in the past about, especially with the Virgin Islands and mediocrity and it being somewhat of a new norm. Um, and while there, there's like some of us that are um, always thinking beyond the basic and beyond the, you know, what's handed to us or what's given to us, um, the example shown by America. And I think um, it's important to understand that, you know, we've, we've never in the Virgin Islands have never had a, a more mediocre-esque society until the American flag flew over the, the country um, or the, the territory. Um, but how do we, yeah, the, how do we reach all those people that are quick to put on blinders and stick in earplugs um, when um, you guys are having conversations with them when we're having conversations with them. And more importantly, how do we either, I know there's the old saying, you can't teach old dogs new tricks, but how do we get the politicians? And um, if you've you've been on with us before and, and heard me speak, I'm intentional about not calling um, many of the politicians in the Virgin Islands leaders. Um, because there is a difference between leaders and politicians, but how do we get them um, to start to consider some of the, the thoughts that not only make sense for a number of different reasons, but will make the territory more progressive than it is right now? Um, is, is there any benefit to trying to, to change that tide or, um, should we consider just, you know, Summer and Dr. Hadia and Kurt running for office <laughs> instead? <laughs> and welcome, Vernon and Darren, by the way. Thanks for having us. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yep. Welcome, Vernon. <laughs> so I noticed they're both. You didn't just um, send a question towards Kurt and Hadia, and they both, I, I see, are still are still muted. <laughs> I felt like I heard such like a long-winded um, response to the last question that I was going to go slow. But I think if I had to give a quick answer to the question, for me, it's all about you compassion, right? And I think that to say that we actually do not have a comprehensive education system that teaches the history of colonialism and its impact on us in the current moment. And, you know, our Senator Genevieve Whitaker has done like a lot of advocacy around this particular issue. And I think it's really important work. And two, in addition to like educating people in the school system, we actually need more research. <laughs> And like I say this all the time and people get very frustrated with me because they think sometimes it's just like overly intellectual. But I honestly think that we have not compiled enough um, easily digestible data on the impact of the U.S. colonial period on our economy, on the extraction of our resources, on the displacement of our people, on the erasure of our culture, on our uh, capacity for trade, and even thinking of something as simple as like our postal service system and what it means in terms of our location in relation to the custom zone. Uh, I don't know that we have adequately measured what we have lost as a result of colonialism. And so I think that for people who hear all of this decolonization talk, it's easy to think, oh, this is really abstract. I don't know what you're talking about without recognizing that for many of us, what we're doing is we're looking closely at the data 
in the wider Caribbean, the contiguous United States and continental Africa, and then tracking it in relation to the phenomenon that we're seeing in the Virgin Islands. But I think it's fair, right, for the community as a whole to call for more um, systematic research to be widely conducted and made available to the community so that we can have um, informed decision making as a part of our decolonization process. And then this is why I always go back to like the question of love and compassion, because I think it's um, possible to recognize that sometimes we just don't know what we don't know, right? And I feel like for many of us, it's easy to stand on this side of like our reading or education or research and wonder like, why hasn't everybody else gotten here? But I think that it's important to make more accessible spaces that are safe and comfortable for us to study together, to be in conversation together, to reason and to ground together, right? In the very um, Afro-Caribbean or Rastafari, also in particular tradition of grounding as a part of our collective um, process and praxis towards liberation. And then this is where arts and culture also becomes really important because ultimately, and I always think of um, Black feminists in particular on this, but if we're talking about freedom and liberation, like revolution has to be desirable. Like people have to want it. There has to be a certain element of like seduction, right? So it can just simply be the matter of, well, here are these like awesome figures, you know, you should want this. There has to be an element of saying, well, this is why our freedom is beautiful. This is why it's cool. This is why we have proud people. This is why we could love ourselves more deeply or with a greater capacity if we had a greater level of freedom. And also, I think that we have to repair hands because some of our tensions in our community, especially as it exists between uh, those who may be classified as ancestral Virgin Islanders, and then those who migrate to the VI from the wider Caribbean, literally undermine our self-determination struggle on multiple fronts. And so I think that we really need to make space for being honest, right, about where we have punched across and harmed each other as people from different parts of the Caribbean and how our freedom as Virgin Islanders or our desire for sovereignty isn't insular, it's actually connected to the wider Caribbean's push for sovereignty, right? How do we make sovereignty more capacious in the parts of the Caribbean that have already achieved sovereignty? And how do we push through our current fear by realizing that some of what we may see or stereotype as being the failures of sovereignty in um, other parts of the Caribbean were also the result of structural forces that are damaging us here in the VI too. So I think that, you know, that would be my uh, response to like how we could kind of go ahead and really push for decolonization in ways that are outside of our little bubbles, really. I, I, I stop in because I want to, if Kurt, you want to jump in. Yeah. Not to say a whole lot, um, but I just kind of wanted to point out that, that she makes such a brilliant point um, when she talks about education being like one of the greatest downfalls of any kind of movement that we could even want to conceive around. Um, decolonization, you know, any like real structural change that brings the kind of equity that we're all desiring, right? Um, because as we, we mentioned a few times earlier, there's this, you know, there's this neoliberal uh, apparatus that our politicians especially um, have adapted. And an, an apparatus is simply, um, you know, strategies around um, strategies around uh, uh, like support of or or the functioning like supported by like concepts uh, of knowledge right or this uh, dissemination of knowledge and so if we have like an uneducated um population around these issues then how can we expect people to really like have conversations about this how can we expect people to not feel intimidated by these these concepts and these themes that just seem so as she mentioned abstract when they're really not right 
they're really not abstract. We're just like ignorant to these realities because we don't have conversations about them. And so we, we're, we're in this position where we're believing that what we have is great. Really, it's, it's terribly, terribly, terribly daunting. Yeah, and if I were to add to that, like really briefly, I think that one of the most humbling parts about teaching um, any class on like race and colonialism that includes the Virgin Islands in particular, while in the contiguous United States, is watching like how my students react to they what they start to learn about our experience, right? And so, you know, many people don't really know much about the VI, but if you sit in that classroom for plus time and you're in college and all of a sudden you have this professor and she's talking about these islands that you don't really know anything about. But then you start to realize like, oh wait, we bought these islands in 1917. Oh wait, the people of this particular space did not get citizenship for a decade. And this um, lack of the control of citizenship is of course very much rooted to anti-blackness and us being a majority of the state. And then you start to think about that and you realize like, oh, okay, wow. So we own people in the Caribbean <laughs> and these people cannot vote for the president of the United States of America. And they have a non-voting representative in Congress. And when we start talking about like and Medicare and so on and so forth, they are the least considered. And then they're on the front lines of like the climate crisis, but the federal spending in the territories is like not quite equal to that um, in state. And it's always so profoundly disheartening to see, well, disheartening um, in the larger context, but like, I guess, heartening when you think about like the students like learning process. But it's sad to witness um, how shocking the violence that we've normalized actually is. And I think that that becomes like one of my greatest hopes for us, that we will start to realize that the way that we are treated is appalling, right? It's appalling, it's yes. unjust, uh, it's a violation of our human rights. And so ultimately, we really have to come to grips with the question of, well, why do we exist? this? You know, what have we internalized? What did we not know about ourselves and our history? Uh, what did we believe about the wider Caribbean or even the United States of America? Like, why don't we think that we're deserving? And then when we start to think about our deservingness, how do we structure the reality of what's possible, right? Because I find that what people say the most to me is decolonization is impossible. <laughs> so you might as well just accept the lot that we are currently in. And I'm just like, but like, why? Why is decolonization impossible? Because that's so you're the quote that you offered earlier um in terms of you were talking about like blackness and the tech space right um and talking about how we're trapped in another person's imagination so i think imagination is the scariest thing right um or the most brilliant thing for the concept of decolonization and liberation and when you said liberation i think that's what i would want to frame it as right people what what it is it is a conversation about liberation right the decolonizing process right to get back to our identity to get back to self value to understand the history and the impact of what has been done to us is actually a pathway towards liberation. It is part of the process. And so I think when you said that, that was like, boom. Because first of all, you also, I have a friend named Tuesday and Tuesday always said, you know, if the revolution was a dance party, more people would come, right? So trying to be in joy and in care and in love while we're having super heavy discussions that are honest and true, like that, that is real. It is a real need for us to enjoy each other and find spaces to laugh while we are talking about the impacts of structural racism, right? So I think a lot of people run from what they perceive as only the heaviness of the conversation, but not the joy of building relationship and finding yourself in relationship to this story. Um, because part of what we will learn about ourselves is actually how brilliant and beautiful and strong and, and capable we are and the ways in which we already have the answers to some 
of what is plaguing us. And so that's like really, that's like a step in liberation to know that nobody don't need to empower me. I am powerful and I can, I just have to choose to. And some of that comes from knowing. And so like, as you guys were talking, I was just like, the path to decolonization, what people like, maybe if I started framing this as a liberation conversation and the role that imagining something completely new has in liberation, um, like helping our children build their imagination so that they're not in the same construct, right? Dr. Dan Miguel Rodriguez, he calls it um, the mitote. And he talks about, you know, like the world that we're living has been designed by somebody else. Like so much, we are stepping into somebody else's design. And um, and in this case, it's a neoliberal, colonial, capitalistic, um, oppressive design, right? And we are we are trying to do our best to wield it. But you cannot, mango tree does not make apple. So something that was not designed to benefit me will never benefit me no matter how I try to reconfigure myself to fit in it. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that's a difficult conversation. And I think it's, you're right, it is scary, but it's like also beautiful because there is, there is another side, right? And so this is by far, I think one of my favorite conversations that we're having right now, because I don't think that people understand that the decolonization conversation is a possibility conversation, right? It is, it is what is possible for us now. And it's actually when you frame it that way, you like, you, we think of our ancestral legacy, you know, I, I hear in my Angelo in my head, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. Have I realized have I realized what Bodho and Queen Mary and all our Virgin Islands heroes, those people who sacrificed for us, have I realized their ideals around sovereignty and liberation and what they were willing to put their life on the line for, right? We, on the end of like Black History Month, we talk about all these really great Black leaders like Edward Wilmot Blyden, Virgin Islander, right? Like Father Pan-Africanism, like we have... And here we are, and when when we talk about like the just the machine that has us like in a still gaze where you actually ain't seeing what is possible for yourself, right? Like that's wow. That makes sense, right? Because as we have this discussion, what we we not just us, as we have this discussion across the diaspora, what we consistently seem to forget or or omit is that freedom is not easy. There's no easy button to this. And colonialism is often comfortable. People get very comfortable receiving the quote unquote benefits of colonialism. And it seems daunting to choose to fight a colonial system that makes your life comfortable or seems to make your life comfortable and choose to fight a fight that is an uphill fight and choose to never give up that fight until the fight is done. That is a very difficult decision to make. So as we have this conversation, this is a great conversation, but the conversation is difficult to move to action because first of all, action has to be planned. So when we talk about education and there being a lack of education, this is why we haven't moved to action because we cannot move without a plan and the plan can't happen without knowledge. And so the lack of knowledge is making us completely stalemate, completely just stagnant. And it makes it very difficult to move from a, a place of awareness to a place of action and from that action to be actually effective. You know, right now in the States, everybody's woke. Everybody's woke. Waking up is the first step. After you wake up, you still gotta go brush your teeth, wash your, <laughs> you know? Like waking up is the first step and then you get dressed and then you go to work. We ain't reached going to work yet. And even this woke phase that we're in in America, look how much effort it took for that to happen. How many people, how many black people had to die, had to get killed by police before there was action, before we moved from, well, you know, there's a problem. Every Growing up, every single black comedian I saw on TV made comments about police brutality, racism in America, it was never a, a hidden subject. It's always been exposed. So why do we have such a difficulty 
moving to action when we see the issues, when we see the faults, when we see that we are being discriminated against for reasons that should have been archaic decades, if not centuries ago. That's my piece. And this is where I would like to quickly highlight like state sanctioned violence, because I think that when we look at the history of action, uh, especially, you know, here in the Virgin Islands, we have 1723, we had 1848, we had 1878. And then when you look at the contiguous United States, we definitively have like a civil rights movement. And we know that there's a pan-African struggle for liberation that has existed for a very long time and is often met with overt and brutal force by the state and by um, white vigilantes, so to speak. And so I think that a part of what's happening, and I have you know, a colleague, uh, Felicia Denad, who talks about this a lot, is just the question is that we're at war <laughs> and we don't necessarily um, understand or recognize the extent to which the forces that are deployed um, against us are indeed the forces of war. And I think that if we even wanted to see just one small example of this, we could look at how the U.S. responds to Black Lives Matter protests versus how they um, responded to the quote unquote attempted coup at the Capitol. And so I think that this discrepancy allows us to um, really think about why exactly we might hesitate. And ultimately it's because we value our lives. <laughs> We value our lives. There's a certain ethics that people have, you know, individually and collectively where they don't necessarily want to take up arms, so to speak. And this is where I find that we start getting into a lot of Caribbean thinkers and like Franz Fanon in particular, which is just the question of, well, what exactly do you do when you protest and protest and protest and your oppressor is not a moral being? What like wh wh where do you go <laughs> once you've arrived at that particular juncture? And I think that that's at the crux of our crisis in the African diaspora. We do not have moral oppressors like at all. And the crisis that we face, the colonial crisis, the climate crisis, the racial injustice crisis, crises, uh, these are all urgent dilemmas. And I think that moving to action becomes essential because ultimately the planet cannot sustain white supremacy. If we're looking at like anthropogenic climate change as an example of the impact of its violence. And so ultimately, I think we're at the stage of trying to like ring the alarm about just how urgent this is and really come to grips with the fact that ain't nobody about to survive if like black people don't survive. Right. Hold on, did you just tie climate change to white supremacy? Are you see, I come off, I come <laughs> off on me to quote her. Love it. Because I think people need to hear it. Like, that's why I come off Love on it. Me. Like, Kandia just said, Dr. Seward just said, which made the most sense. The, the planet cannot survive white supremacy. It can't survive this extractionary mode. Um, This, you know, like, so it is... It, it is, it kills everything. It functions like a parasite, right? And it just extracts and it takes and it takes and it takes and it depletes. And you're right, they, they, <laughs> the planet cannot survive it. But I wanted to say two things when you were talking. I think what people miss, right? When, we, when you use the word war, people begin to think of conflict zones, right? And because we don't have people in, you know, on the back of military trucks driving around with guns in suits, they don't see us at war. But there is a war around our food, right? So my work is food justice. There is, and the National Farm School Network of which I'm on the advisory board, like this year we came to the realization, right? We have a call for action for racial justice because we realized without racial justice, there will not be any food justice, right? And it is the same without racial justice, there's not economic justice. Without racial justice, there's not climate justice, right? Racial justice has been the crux of all these other injustices. It is the father. It is the root that has allowed these other injustices to, to become more insidious, um, to hide themselves from us. And so we don't even realize that we are in a war where we live in our own home and we can't afford to buy land, 
right? Land that is land that is ours. We use the word, so for me, the words access and transfer transparency are becoming fallacies because there's no real invitation for me to participate. Things that should be transparent and that I should have access to actually are labyrinths and puzzles. And for me, if you really want me to know, you will make it visible. You will invite me. You will actually come pick me up. If you want me to come to your house to eat dinner and I tell you I don't have transportation, you don't come pick me up, walk me to the table and say, here, you're welcome. So like we we are at war because we're not really welcome. We're not really invited in. The mechanisms, the mechanisms are so contrarian that, yes, they make it so difficult for you to be part. It's because they want to tire, tire you out. And that is a strategy of torture. Right, you know, like when you got somebody in a torture chair and you you let them get this close to sleep and then you throw water on the face. Starvation is torture. We import 98% of our food. We have not taken the lens of the strategies of war and see how they're weaponizing it against us invisibly. And you know, I always, you know, I'd always be my father to be like, here's my conspiracy theorist daughter. But it's not a conspiracy theory if for 40 years, 43 years, we have a 98% import rate and children don't know what Miss Pull and Mommy is, and we have tamarind dropping on the ground, mango rotting, um, sour sap, sugar apple. All those things that is food, we no longer identify as food deliberately. So now we have increased food waste, but people suffering from morbid obesity because I was taught to eat at a franchise. And you use your system, your marketing, your resources to ensure. So how we forever, if we can't figure out our own personal health situation, Vernon, what revolution we gonna sign up for if I can't run? You understand? You already the strategy at a war is complex. When you have a eighty percent of your population suffering with some form of obesity-related chronic disease, you have an ineffective militia. Period, and that is war. Sorry. Somebody I mean, we're already seeing it. We, we, I mean, we, we've even shifted to using drones for everything and soldiers less. So, and even if you speak to certain military factions, it's, it's already happening. We're too obese to defend each other, to defend ourselves, to defend our nation. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a bigger problem, but I don't want to go into that. It's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but Kevin, what you were about to say? Um, just two, two things quickly. One, some of, um, you're connected with house people, so we can, you're going to be able to get around. Um, and strap you to the back of a hut and, and we're good. Um, but the, the other thought as, um, as you guys are speaking, the, the thought in my mind the most is, um, what do you guys think will be the, the tipping point? So we've, a lot of people get shocked. Um, every time something happens in the United States of America, they're shocked that it happened to people that look like us. But if you think about how the country was created and who the country was created for, um, nothing should ever shock you when it's targeted towards us. Because um, I, you know, I often say, you know, they they kind of messed up when they didn't do a round trip ticket um, for us. Um, and here we are now. And there's part of me that's like, you know, we built it. Um, and so tough luck, <laughs> um, everything that's beautiful about American culture comes from us, from food to music, to style, to, um, you know, even, even acting and a lot of the awards that people of color don't get, but they deserve because they quite frankly acted their ass off and they're like the best of the best in every single segment that there is out there. Um, and so there's there's that part, but there's also that the the flip side, the people that believe that this, you know, we built, we ran away from um, Great Britain and we built this country for us and it's supposed to be ours. Um, and so I always have conflicted thoughts when I think about it because, you know, it's, 
yeah, that, that whole idea of, of being shocked when things happen is like, I, I can't be shocked at all. Um, and I noticed it even today, um, you know, I, I struggle every time Megan McCain opens her mouth, but she, you know, in talking about the, the fallout um, from the interview from Harry and Megan, um, she kind of chaired on the forefathers and how they like created this country for us. And it's, it's you know, a, it's so much better than their system and um, quote unquote democracy is the way to go. She's not, you know, there is some flaws there in, in her thinking and like all the other stuff that happens here. Um, but yeah, what a, a lot of thoughts that I can't unpackage, but what, what um what do you guys think the the tipping point will be where where when will we say you know what maybe america isn't the best country and maybe we 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 shouldn't be fighting for you know i remember a conversation we had at, at best uh, a couple of years ago when we we um it was a dinner conversation about you know um celebrating being black and you know the fact that Black history doesn't start with um, slavery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was a heated debate shut us down because there was one and one group was like, you know, we should be voting for president. And then the other group was like, well, why, why don't you want to, you know, define who you are um, as a Virgin Islander and not necessarily as an American? And yeah. Yeah, I'm just yeah. curious to, to, to That's a big question. your thoughts on where you think when it's that a big happen, question. If it will happen um and all of it. I think I think that's the biggest issue. I mean, we are saying we we sharing that with Puerto Rico, where Puerto Rico has half of them that say, listen, we need to be a state, and another half say we need to be independent. And the same thing is going on here in the VI where we, we can't decide if we want to put one shoe in or one shoe out. And so once we do decide that, my next question I think is where are you going to also is what would it take for us to then gain some kind of ground in order to achieve what we want to do? Because, for example, the Black Lives Matter campaign uh, was supported internationally before it really gained traction. People from all over the world jumped on. When we have a crisis, a, nat a natural disaster crisis, then is when people say, oh, that's the VI? Oh, we need to help them. Let's make sure that we, we send supplies and we got all kind of stuff from all over the place, right? So how would, if we have this, this is our new crisis, colonialism and what it's doing to us and our culture and whatnot. How do we get the world to acknowledge us, to even pay attention to us when the world is burning? Literally, there's, all, there's, there's a crisis, there's a fire in every place, right? So us, our little, little VI, we have a population of, what, less than 200,000 including the illegal immigrants, I assume. And how could we even get our voice heard loud enough to, to get change? Is that even possible? You know, I mean, it has, I have to yeah. imagine it's possible, but. And, and yeah, but, but still that's outside of the VI. I'm, and I'm, I was more concerned about or questioning inside the VI. There are a lot of us that, that just swears that you know, the American dollar is the best thing in the world, and mm -hmm. it, the U.S. is the greatest country in the world. Um, you know, notwithstanding, you know, how much the U.S. is in debt to a number of other countries, um, that would nudge you, you to think about, you know, is that like a reality? But like, how do we internally um, start to because like decolonization is not going to happen until the masses and the VI say, okay, you know, it's, that's not the way to go. That's not the road that we want to take. So how do we do that um, locally? Hey, Dominic, welcome. So let me package, so let me package, because I was tracking and I, that was like a deep question, right? And um, so I just wanted to say the question I think on the table or the topics for conversation is um, what is the tipping point? what does the what do we think the process of self-determination could or should look like and where do we stand in um attracting global support 
for our colonization as a small territory. And anybody could take that question, but I think that might be the like three best ways to sum up the conversations that kind of just went past. Um, can I start? Yes, please. Okay, so what I want to say is um, what I said in, in, the, in, the, in the private chat was whether you move towards independence or statehood, it requires the same thing with a diversified and um, globally relevant economy because, you know, I mean, if you're independent, you got to have your own industries and whatnot, right? You got to have your tax base and all of that, right? But if you're a state, remember, I don't know if you remember, all of us, I think we've all lived in the States at one point and, um, you know, living in the States, you pay federal and state tax. You pay two sets of taxes. Now, does our economy as it is, can it support people paying two sets of taxes? No. So I'm just saying like whether, even if you become a state, we gotta pay more tax. We have a economy in order to pay the taxes that's required of being an American, which is, and every American has in the States has to pay the federal state. Sometimes you have a third level of tax, municipal tax. So, you know, so I knew New York, New York City, you have federal tax, you have your tax you pay to New York State in Albany, and then you have New York City municipal taxes, right? So how is it that, you know, if we're gonna do all this groundwork to be a, to have the developed economy to be a state, you might as well do the groundwork to be, to have a developed economy to be independent. Cause to me, it requires the same thing. It requires the same changes in order to be made. It's just, do we wanna live? What do we wanna live with? Because once you go to statehood, you can't go back. That, that's it. That's it's a permanent decision. Okay, it's a one hundred percent permanent decision. So, and you, we could make that if we think that's the best thing. I mean, Martinique and Guadeloupe decide to go to statehood in nineteen forty six, but then you fast forward to now. Like I was there in two thousand thirteen in Guadeloupe, and it's like you could tell the place have don't have a real economy. They don't they, like it, it, it's heavily reliant upon subsidies from Paris. So you got, you know, you go to Guadeloupe, you got a lot of big buildings, nice roads, a lot of Mercedes Benz and so, but where's the economy? The, the only thing they export is rum. The only thing they export to France is rum, bananas, and people. Okay. Okay. Go to France, you see a lot of people from Guadeloupe and Martinique living there. So, um, you know, it's like, it's like, what do we really want? You know, it's like, what do we really want? Because you become a state, you're going to be like the, 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 the so-called mother country or a ministering power going to still treat you. They could still treat you bad because of just due to the fact that your state has a lot of black people in it. So it's still going to be treated you know, that's why I'm glad we brought up the race, the racism discussion, because that's still going to play a role, even if we have the full rights of voting for the president and all of these things. Still, well, it's a jurisdiction popular with black people owned by a country that hasn't dealt with its issues with black people. So <laughs> either way, I think it's the same amount of work. Yeah. So I think that's, that's why I think we shouldn't be scared about the other options that don't involve statehood. So, okay, that's it. I mean, oh, you, you had more to say? Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. No, no that's it. I'm, I'm finished. So you make a good point, and, and this is the part I kind of struggle with, with the conversation, is like, where, for me, is like, the part that you mentioned, right, it requires a, a extremely drastic change, and I'm not sure if, when I say people, I mean in the masses, are ready for that change, like you said, it might come with a diversified economy that also includes, you know, more taxes. And, you know, in this current economy, we can't really support it. So for me, it's like, unless if we're, we're talking about decolonization, which I am open to, we also got to talk about a plan that takes us to that place. And that's not going to happen in a year, five years, whatever the case is. But that means we have to be completely, you know, unreliant to a national power. And I don't think we're, we've really had that honest conversation 
because I will say, like, right now, if you ask him us, you know, USVI in 2021, we're nowhere near to the point where we could say, hey, let's be on our own and we'll be fine. We're not there yet. And I think that's the one part that um, I really want us to make sure that we ha are open and honest about. Hmm. Yeah, actually, I would jump in and say a couple things. One to the question of how do we get global support? I would actually reframe that a little bit and frame it a little less as how do we get global support and a little more is like, how do we play our role in global revolution, right? Because technically this question of how can people who are oppressed on the basis of race or class or gender or sexuality, um, ethnicity, et cetera, live lives <laughs> that are safe from the oppressive power structure is one that's taking place all over the globe, really and truly. And so I think that people are already, to some extent, co-identified with our plight, even if they don't necessarily understand our particular context. And so I think for us as Virgin Islanders, that's part of what we have to do, which is work that Virgin Islanders were doing, I think, arguably in the 60s, you know, through the 80s, um, a bit more so than now, is this work of making it explicitly clear that we too are feeling the squeeze of the aftermath of um, slavery and the contemporary colonial landscape. And so I would hope that we would play our part in the global struggle, but also play our part in our like own history, so to speak. So to go back to Summer's point earlier, like are we actually living out the legacy that our freedom fighters fought for? And I think about this a lot, especially as it relates to 1733, because how exactly do you have this struggle for black sovereignty right here on St. John, right? And we ourselves now are grappling with shying away from the question of self. And so I really do wonder, you know, in a similar vein to Summer, like what do we owe our ancestors, so to speak, in the struggle for freedom? And Frantz Fanon used to say that every generation got find their mission, fulfill it or betray it. And I think that a part, sorry, we had like, you know, getting close to bedtime, but a part of what I think we really have to do as Virgin Islanders is take stock of, well, what is it exactly that we were fighting for historically? And then think about the fact that we didn't just launch this fight in the Virgin Islands. Because when we start thinking about Edward Wilma Blyden and Hubert Harrison, um, Barbara Christian, and so on and so forth, what we start to realize is that Virgin Islanders had historically a particular like praxis around freedom that was very invested in Black liberation, not only in the Danish West Indies, now US Virgin Islands, but also in the world. And wherever we went, we were invested in advancing this particular struggle for freedom and playing very critical roles to advance Pan-Africanism, Black socialism, um, literary revolution, so on and so forth. And so I think that it's important for us to not shy away from this particular history, but to think about, well, how can we contribute to it? And to the question of like, okay, well, how do we move forward? Because I think everybody always wants like the practical like, well, what can we do now? And I feel like one, of course, we got organized, 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 which is a bit difficult when we find ourselves dealing with multiple challenges. But um, if I were to kind of break it down, well, what can we ask our government for? I feel like we need a permanent political status commission because a lot of the work that previous generations of Virgin Islanders have done around political status is not immediately legible to us. And so often when we engage the struggle, we think we're starting from scratch without having clear access to the archives and the records and the work that was being done prior to us. And we also need this political status commission to help with the processes of conducting research, but also the processes of community advocacy and to have a permanent body that can engage in a lot of the global conversations around decolonization. And then I think we need the rampant education that we discussed earlier, both in our education systems, but also um, in terms of like conducting new and original research on this particular issue, so that we can craft a very clear evidence-based plan to move forward with. And that at the time in the future, when we go on the referendum, we're actually doing so with like an informed perspective of um, the clear possibilities. And I think that 
specifically, we have a lot of like narratives that I think we need to still work on reframing and reshifting. And in particular, how we think about the independence movement that already happened across the Caribbean. Because often when I hear us talk, we have a certain rhetoric around what we understand to be the failures of, um, and let's say Virgin Islanders often like to cite Haiti as an example in particular. And I think that we have to recognize that our struggle as Virgin Islanders cannot be to find the most privileged position in um, the prevailing order of like domination by you know hinging our little float to the underside of this particular empire. And then looking at everyone else and saying, well, fuck up, you know? I think that we have to recognize that there are more struggles that need to take place on a global scale, and we have to play our role in it. And it wouldn't even be sufficient for us as well as an We got equal access to, you know, sit at the table and have full voting rights in America if America is still the kind of empire that it is on the global scale. And so I think for us, we have to kind of shift to really think about, well, what is actually the just world on a broad level? So I have a, I, I have a question. This is kind of pointing in Dominic's direction, but is there an example of a successful uh, decolonization in especially a, a country as small as ours, yeah, whether it be in our hemisphere or in the other hemisphere? Is is is, are there examples that we could follow that we can study that we just are not? I don't know of them personally, so I'm asking. Um, we come, decolonization, you mean like, um, so a, a country that has achieved full independence, if we have any examples. Full, of not, only, not only achieved full independence, but that has then gone on to be a, a prominent or at least a country that um, is sustainable and proven that it actually benefited from said decolonization rather than it becoming a detriment. That's what that's specifically. Right. Well, I would say, um, well, my, my, my son, mother's peoples are from St. Kitts Nevis and I, I go there sometimes. And down there, I, I think, I don't want to say down, I assume south to the southeast. I believe that over there, they, um, it, 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 it's an interesting place because it, they've come, they've overcome a lot in their, um, you know, I, I mean, we got, we got to define successful, but I, I feel like, um, like when it comes to, let me put it this way. They got people going to St. Kitts for a better life, okay? From the same countries that come here. And they, just like people go to St. Thomas for a better life, we're from the same countries that they go to St. Kitts Nevis for a better life. And and people from St. Kitts Nevis that leave, they ain't really coming here anymore. They, they, the ones that want to go to a U.S. place, they're going to the States. Because why are they going to waste their U.S. visa and come here? And here and there is on the same type of level of um standard of living so to speak so it's like let me, let me give you an example right i was walking around in the neighborhood where my son's family is from right so i am um i see like a safari bus like the same safari you see in st thomas and they 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 in a um in this neighborhood and they have a bunch of tourists what I saw was very strange. They 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 carry the tourists them to somebody yard to watch a noni tree, you know. And all the people in the neighborhood come out. People selling the little um handcraft with the the the, 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 the handcraft coconut. They, so a popular thing is saying kids they make a little turtle thing. Where the turtle have a bubbly head, not battery operated, but the turtle the bubbly head the, the move by itself. Mm -hmm. Out of coconut and wire and whatever, and it's a big thing in Saint Sometimes the, 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 the teenagers come, they have the pet monkey, they charge people 10 US to take a picture of the monkey. It is quick money, quick money into the community. They bring a bus with like 40 people and they're watching cultural stuff. They're not watching no fake stuff. They're watching a noni tree in somebody's yard. They, they paying teenagers to, to take pictures with a monkey and, and, and um, buying people um, handcrafts. 
To me, that's money going directly into the community. In in Frederickstead, they don't even um the taxi them don't even stop by the um the little garden by um the, the, the garden that involved with um the Rotary Club out by Mali. They pass it straight going to carry them Christian stead. When they, when they pick up from the cruise ship before COVID. Chat so community, chat community yeah. garden and um young bloods. I know yeah, you know yeah, yeah. young blood community garden they pass it straight. The only um, time the only time they get tourists coming to buy things is like the, the air tourists that stay in the town that walking around, but not the cruise tourists before COVID. I don't even I don't know if we're gonna get to cruise like cruise ships again. I don't even know if it makes us make sense to even talk about it. But so I, uh, but back I, then, yeah, that's what they used to do. But I'm saying in them in them independent islands, they, they the people more involved. The only time you see exploitation in St. Kitts is um by the um Port Zante, the, 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 the port where um, we uh, sell jewelry and stuff. They got a lot of Indians that live in St. Martin that come over and sell. But so, they, that's the only place you see foreigners interfering. Why don't you leave that port? It's all locals involved in it. So I want to, like for me though, I just want to clarify, like decolonization um, and sovereignty, like to decouple a few things. For me, decolonization is not just the process of being um, status-wise free from our colonizers and um, having a thriving economy. I think that's an amazing achievement and it's one step. There's this internalized oppression, there's this identity piece, there's reclaiming the, there's reclaiming the cultural um, ancestral legacy um, and bringing that into a future that's relevant now where people people feel proud. So like, Vernon, when you ask the question, a country that has successfully decolonized and is thriving, for me, I am looking at twofold. Yes, the economy is doing well, they're stable, and the way in which they attract and make money is, is, is in a just um, manner that is centered on the people of the place, right? And and they are doing the work to decouple themselves from the, the colonialist narrative. So they're finding their identity, which, which that in itself is a process, right? There's layers and layers of unpacking pain points, historical injustices. There's so much work to do that. And I just like, and that's how my brain sees this journey towards liberation, which, which decolonization and the conversation is the crux of is it's like twofold. It's the self and then of course it's the place. You know, there's there's a restoration of like indigenous trees. There's the, the, the transformation of the education system. There's relevant adequate health care or preventative medicine that's rooted in indigenous medicine medicinal practices because we're eating different. There is mother tongue as the national tongue. We could talk in our language. We could write in our language, acknowledging our way of speaking as a language. But yeah, we also know how to converse in a standardized common way across the region or with other countries. Um, it's so for me, when we talk about decolonization, the economic and the political status of our nation is just one small part, right? And so we don't have to start there for me. For me, we could start with the mind processes, the identity. Like, I mean, I think we start where it's right for the picking. And we start with a place that don't need the political status commission yet, which is why I think we're having this conversation. And these conversations become so relevant because this is the informal education piece, the platform piece, the visibility piece. Um, Frank, you want to read this comment? <clears throat> sure. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Independence should never be considered as an option for the Virgin Islands. You will have a two-class system, wealthy and poor. Corruption will increase tenfold, and locals will have to migrate elsewhere. It will further di disenfranchise those who served in the military and are receiving disability benefits. Again, Entertaining the conversation of independence is losing focus on what we need to do to improve our status nationally. Ain't that where we are now? I, I like to say that the status quo is <laughs> doing a lot of accomplishing that. Is this person living in the VI? Does he read yes. the newspaper every day? And so Kurt, Mr. Ventura? Speaker, I want to hear what Kurt has to say. He was just like off speaker. <laughs> 
I'm like, wait a minute, man. Huh? Like, do we be living in different societies right now? Yes, um, Stevie Wonder, because see what's going on, man. What's going on, man. What's going on, Mr. Ventura, man. I want to uh, come back to the question of like, how do we, uh, how do we, um, I guess, get to a point where we're having this like larger global engagement. Um, I think honestly, somewhere you made, you, you started to make that point. And, and when we in small circles and we're talking, you know, Hadi and I and others, we make this point often. Honestly, I feel it starts with Virgin Islanders experiencing radical self-love. Honestly, I think we've spent, we've been for generations now, like desiring something that has been like uh, presented to us as better than. We don't even understand ourselves as a people. We don't take pride in ourselves as a people. Virgin Islanders don't love Virgin Islanders. And so I I think we need to get to a point where we experience some kind of radical self-love and we get to a position where we want to celebrate the fact that no, friggin' Kalaloo in a, a, a Calabash bowl is not what your idea of a five-star meal is, but you know what? That's like the most amazing thing we could experience. You know what I'm saying? That that that's that's Sorry. that's that's us. That's what we do. That's who we are, that's what we do. It gives us comfort. You know what I mean? It's like we go through like the year, like miserable and we're struggling and then the holidays comes around and we're eating this food that making us feel old. We're singing the songs, we're doing the dances, we're seeing family, we're experiencing club and, and culture and all this wholesomeness that makes us who and gives us like that sense of purpose, even if it's fleeting and just for that moment, right? Just for that time and just for that season. But it starts with Virgin Islanders acknowledging the fact that we need to love up on ourselves. And when we start to love up on ourselves, we start to shift perspective. Virgin Islanders don't even have equity in a Virgin Islands context right now. You know what I'm saying? This guy make a comment about displacement. Me boy, you know what St. John look like. <laughs> I'm like, w w w w and so this idea, right? This idea that somehow these conversations, as, as had so I pointed out earlier, this idea that these conversations are new and that these and they don't have precedent. I mean, come on. People saying John had to fight for against condemnation without representation in the 60, 50s and 60s. They're saying no. We are having a new conversation about disenfranchisement and displacement. This is like generational, and there's generational exhaustion and in that process too. So when Virgin Islanders come together collectively and talk about wanting more because what we're getting ain't enough and it hasn't been enough. I think people also need to understand that they need to give us that space because we dissolve it. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry. Ooh. No, no, I love it. Like, ooh. But I think one of the problems is, oh, self-esteem and Virgin Island pride are first. Once attained, we will make a unified effort. Second, we must determine a sound economic base with equity for all. Third, a sound education construct with continuity, Fourth, a constitutional document that demands prolonged advancement for the people and their offspring. So I see the last name. Is that person related to you, Hadia? Yes, my great uncle. Larry Seward? My great uncle. Yeah. Hello! <laughs> um, Larry. So I wanted to say, I think part of the thing is we are disconnected. So I don't understand St. John's story. I'm not paying attention to St. John's story. As a, so I was born in St. Thomas. I live on St. Croix. We become steeped in our own, um, in our own, I want to say mud, mess, quicksand, right? So we have, we have these, our stools, they've made it or it is structured so we are so steeped in our own urgency that is hard for us to understand or even recognize like what you say, St. John is experiencing displacement right now. What do you mean, right? But for me on St. Croix, but that might not necessarily be my truth. You guys are in like mid prime gentrification, right? And I am seeing gentrification differently in St. Croix now. It's been here where there's been a socioeconomic divide, right? But now, you know, beware of the white jogger. It's happening. 
And so you you see it now more differently. And so I think it's that that with the depth of relationship, we are no longer in deep relationship with one another. So your story seems foreign to me. So it can be that I am displaced, right? Because I don't live there. I don't know. And we need to we need to do a better job of being in relationship as three islands that represent one place and one people, even though there's parts of us, I guess. Um, I was going to defer to Frank, but so go ahead, Frank, and we're coming close to time. Well, I, since I missed a lot of the conversation, um, I mean, I guess I can just say where I stand on the matter. Um, I think what I heard from you, Summer, in terms of decolonizing our minds, um, and then in regards to radical self-love, decolonizing our hearts, um, and being able to accept ourselves as whole Virgin Islanders, um, and be able to understand and accept what that is, whatever that will mean to us um, collectively and individually, uh, is where I see it all beginning. Um, beyond that, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I do think that we should be removing ourselves from our colonial status. Um, I don't think we should be a territory anymore. Um, I prefer the latter of moving towards independence and, and finding a way to create our sustainability, um, either through developing closer relationships with other Caribbean nations um, and, and really becoming more associated with the region, um, which makes a whole lot of sense. Um, just look at a map. Um, I, I think that's one way to begin. I don't think that when we if we were to become independent of the United States, I don't think it means we're going to sever our ties and, you know, create some kind of enemy. Um, I think, you know, in, in the way that politics work in the world, you know, a smart thing for us to do it to be to remove ourselves and keep some kind of beneficial relationship, whatever that means. I don't know. I mean, I guess usually when it comes to the U S it's something to do with their military. Um, which I'm sure they would never give up anyway. So, um, but I, I think that we should be independent. I, I, I really do. I, I think that that there is a way for us to create our industry, um, industries to sustain us, um, given what we currently have. And I think that anything else that we export to the world can be niche and, and high quality and we can make money off of it. I think there's a lot of opportunities for growth in the Virgin Islanders, in the Virgin Islands, but I think it starts with us as Virgin Islanders being able to have that pride and, and, and that self-love so that we can and see our worth and, and see our value in what we do without it having to mimic or cater to anybody else but ourselves. I think if we do the best for ourselves, to me, that's the best tourism product, you know, like, I'm in tourism, so it's like it's not something I want to do away with, but I definitely would like to rearrange the structure of how it currently is set up. I, I, I think that tourism should be like inviting people into our home. And, you know, you get to see what we have to offer. You get to see how we live and what we do. And you know what? If you're cool, you can enjoy it with us, too. Other than that, you don't need to come because because mm -hmm. you, you don't need to be here. You know, Hello, MS. I, <laughs> your money is not your money is not worth destroying our, our peace of mind and our and our infrastructure to create something separate for you. We can create the yeah. best for ourselves. And, you know, you can come by with us and um, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. I, I was just trying to get a lot out since I, I missed everything. But I hope the conversation went well tonight, guys. I can't wait to look back at the video and, and go through the comments. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Frank. It's gonna be I think interesting to go through the comments um tonight after um after some of the comments that we've we've seen tonight. Um what I I'll add is that I agree with you, 
Um, I think that, you know, as we look ahead, tourism should be just one part. I think there are many industries, um, you know, that we need to, we should be focused on um, when we start to think about, you know, the maritime industry, about um, sustainable energy, um, you know, the things that, you know, I, I would have loved it if given an opportunity to reimagine what the the, the um, old Hovenza site um, could do for us um, in in a clean and um, equitable way. Um, but of course, I'm not um, Governor Kemet or anything. Um, but I think um, going back to that thought, I mean, that that comment um, highlights what a lot of our unfortunately community thinks about our relationship with the US. And I think, you know, Vernon mentioned the word woke. Um, I'm still not sold that a lot of people are actually woke. I think a lot of people say that they're woke because it's the buzzword of the time, but I think it's it's very sad and um, you know, I, and I'll say that for even for me living in Florida right now, it's very sad that um, anyone can have that kind of, um, I want loyalty to the US might not be the right word, but the, the idea that, um, that independence is, would be so horrible and um, we so need the US um, for everything that is for demands is, um, it's unfortunate because the country has shown us time and time again, whether it's through our, our current status right now as an unincorporated territory, through the way that um, people that look like us are dying across the US. Um, and, you know, one of, Dominic mentioned about the, the taxes of federal and, and state taxes that, that these states paid. Um, you know, that was one of the comments that a lot of the Congress um, congressmen and women made in, in the few times I've been on Capitol Hill is that, you know, the Virgin Islands isn't getting the support that they should get because they're not paying federal taxes. Um, and that's just crazy when you think about it because we didn't ask to be an unincorporated territory. Um, it was given to us. And so the fact that you as the cop- You wanna pick up the, that the, comment the, while, you're, while you're talking to Kim? Go ahead, cause I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, I, I just the think comments it's crazy is, that we're still bending over backwards for the U.S. when we shouldn't be. The true. End. Join the convo late, but appreciate what I did here. Question for the panel. What needs to happen specifically for this type of conversation to move to an action level? For example, the issue of radical self-love. Is it a grassroots communication campaign or bigger picture issues? Is it a formal coalition, a seat at certain tables, funding for whatever? I mean, I think it's all of that. So, it, it, so <clears throat> go ahead, yeah, Summer. Yeah. Well, Please. well um, I agree. I think it's all of that. I think having access to resource, having invitations and spaces at tables, I think would help. Um, it would be wonderful to have a radical love campaign. It would be wonderful to have a liberation campaign, and it would be one. It would be wonderful for us to be able to to be sourced to do the research that um, Dr. Sewer was talking about, to kind of begin to quantify what have been the impacts of colonization on the territory in spaces of food, economic justice, land loss, different things like that, and to take those facts out into the community. I want to thank um, everyone on this panel. I asked to close specifically, right, because it's VI History Month. And, and for me, these conversations are history in the making. And in all of our own rights, even the people who are on, watching us on Facebook, um, the, the leaders we have elected, we are making history. We are part of our children's history. And we have a responsibility to see ourselves as such, right? Good ancestors. Um, I, I, defend, I have great ancestors and that's, that's the legacy we should be working towards. And so I wanted to mention that in VI History Month that 30, 40 years from now, our conversations will matter and they will be counted as someone's history. So the goal of all of us is to be good ancestors and to leave them with a legacy that they can be proud of. 
And, um, you know, when we close our eyes to be proud of the things that we did and the way that we did it, I wanted to big up Dr. Sewer because it's Women's History Month. And, you know, we, we tend to talk about people when they no longer are standing but you're here and we should give each other flowers. So thank you for your leadership, for your dedication, for the time that you have put in to become someone who can own this knowledge in such a way that you can bring it home and share it with us. So for Women's History Month, I honor you and thank you for making time to be with us. Um, thank your children and your husband and Kurt, the same to you. Thank your partner, everybody, for allowing us to have the two hours together um, to make space for a really robust conversation. And I also for our viewers and their comments, we need space for the other, right? So I was really happy to see the comment about someone who wanting to lean towards more a nationalistic um, pathway, because if we don't open the door for everybody to come and have a conversation, we'll never, meet, we'll never have a majority consensus on the path forward. And with that, Tonight's Politox has been about the path to decolonization. Wonderful conversation. Um, I am, may we take it into tomorrow, right? That's it. It's a wrap. And Frank, come on, because the beard comment, are you? He hear me talking about Kemet Beard. And he had, I really to, did it, but, he had to show up. But you know, good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>